welcome everyone um, to this uh, debate, to this discussion, presentation. And I would invite during the presentation, any persons who wish to ask any questions or make any comments, if they could put it into the chat section. Uh, and then we will be able uh, to deal with these uh, later on. It is and has been said that the, a museum is the most democratic form of education in that you can enter it, you can uh, uh, appreciate it and absorb it according to your level. You, you don't have to pass an exam uh, to enter or have any special qualification apart from a general interest in whatever subject the museum is dealing with or the con country it is covering. Uh, and therefore, the Barbados Museum, when it was established, followed a number of very varied eclectic museums across the Caribbean. These museums usually began as an attachment to the public libraries or the reading rooms um, that existed. And in certain cases, just simply interested individuals, sometimes within their businesses, who had either collected or had persons provide them with interesting artifacts to display. So in every Caribbean town in the early 20th century, some even earlier, and if we go back to things like places like the Jamaica Institute, uh, organizations like that, which were a combination of, of library and research center and educational gathering, membership being uh, of interesting people who uh, had various interests in those particular territories. Usually it was a balance between history and uh, botany, wildlife generally. And um, of course, as well, indigenous artifacts, pre-Columbian artifacts. We find up and down the Caribbean, many of these museums or uh, cabinets of curiosities uh, involving uh, and showing off uh, artifacts which had been picked up mainly by planters, farmers, persons who were exploring various parts of the islands and came across uh, this. It could even be, in certain cases, excavation for building construction. And so you, you find that the early museums within the Caribbean were composed of these two things. That was wildlife, um, the collection, for instance, of bird's eggs, of stuffed animals, um, and also those artifacts from the pre-Columbian times. And then later as well, mainly plantation um, materials, uh, ornate silverware and china, etc. I certainly remember on my first visit to the Barbados Museum in the early 1960s, it certainly was very different than it is now. The concentration was essentially on plantation ware, um, uh, copious glass cases with uh, beautiful china and silverware, all basically plantation origin, and then quite an extensive section uh, with wildlife, that is eggs, stuffed animals, birds, uh, and, that, and the like. I think one of the last raccoons to have survived in Barbados uh, was stuffed and placed in one of those uh, cases. Then there was a children's section, a very um, interesting and for a child, from my perspective, fascinating little dioramas that covered the history of Barbados. Very detailed done by volunteers. And um, this gave a little overview uh, of the history and the way of life. It began with a, a small diorama of the indigenous people on a beach in Barbados, uh, and it continued on through uh, to the early 20th century. So these fascinating little bits and pieces uh, formed the first museum. And then the big change from my recollection of it came with the opening uh, of a completely revised main permanent exhibition in 1985, 
uh, during the visit of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, the second visit to Barbados. Um, and many of those cases uh, still, still survive. And then of course, the branching off into um, the uh, interest within Africa, African section, improvement of the children's section, because it was realized that a lot of um, the visitors, the large number of visitors were school children coming in. Uh, the Barbados Museum it has a reputation for its Cunard Gallery, great collection of uh, prints engravings, and more recently actual oil paintings, significantly those by Agostino Brunias, and uh, then also a gallery dedicated uh, to uh, furniture um, set in, in rooms. Uh, and of course, the uh, occasional uh, temporary exhibition the map collection is excellent, uh, the map collection of, of Barbados. And so over the years, there has been, of course, as the society changed and as the perception of people's uh, understanding of their history changed, uh, the Barbados Museum changed as well. And this was happening across the region, but the Barbados Museum and Historical Society really uh, had a permanence to it. Uh, government backing, of course, but a really dedicated team changing at it as it was over the generations, a dedicated team of, of members who helped to guide the museum forward. And so to give more details on this and certainly to elaborate on the whole question of museums in the late 20th and early 21st century, I'd like to pass over to the director of the Barbados um, Museum, uh, Dr. Alessandra Cummins. Alessandra. Uh, thank you very much for those introductory remarks, um, Lennox. Very much appreciated. Um, I want to share my screen and to be able to see it. Does everyone see it? Yes, uh, at least I do. All right. I'm not sure why I'm not. We are seeing your email. Right. Well, I'm not sure why you're not seeing my um, PowerPoint. Let me stop that share and go back and try sharing again. There. Oh, sorry. Here it is. There we go. Right. Okay. Um, Perfect. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my special pleasure to talk to you on today of all days. This is the 90th anniversary day of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. And I'm very pleased to be invited to speak or on the origins of a museum in the island of Barbados. And less so, um, just to be clear, less so on the 20th and 21st century and more on the, what you might call the, the prehistory of the Barbados Museum. Because the title origins of a museum in the island of Barbados is a title redolent of so many things. And the notion of origins still to be uncovered um, the idea of a or the museum in the setting, the context of the island for the creation of the museum, and of course, the role of Barbados itself in making this a reality. I'm extremely grateful to my colleagues and peers to have taken on the critical role of expanding over the last several weeks on the knowledge about the development of the museum particularly from the 20th century and into the 21st century, covering areas inclusive of the, the historical development, the administration, the policy, um, the archeology span and the uh, curatorial aspects of the museum. These have been important groundings for your understanding of what I'm going to cover today. For me, the previous presentations serve to set the tone and really capture this 
20th, 21st century transformation of the institution, such as what um, uh, Dr. Honey Church has described um, earlier in intimate detail. I'm immensely grateful for that as it affords me the opportunity to, to therefore focus my attention, my presentation in completely a different direction. And I've chosen instead to interrogate the idea or the history of the museum, or to be more precise, the history of the idea of the museum for Barbados, for an entity which would ultimately become this Barbados Museum and Historical Society. I've decided really to focus on recalling key moments when the idea for the Barbados Museum emerges, how and in what context this desire for a museum is articulated, who are the major proponents of this idea and how this aspiration, and indeed one might almost say ambition, was finally achieved with the establishment of the BMHS. One might, the museum might actually claim origins of almost a hundred years earlier if we look at instances when this idea is discussed. So while I will not propose a linear progression um, to emerge from my remarks, I do want to suggest that there probably is the chronological sequencing in terms of the emergence and engagement with this idea of a museum which might be the result of growth of interest in a number of areas such as has already been outlined. I'm bringing us then home to the, the notion that an institution of the nature of the Barbados Museum could in fact take on these roles. So with those introductory comments, I think what I want to begin to discuss is what um, the cultural theorist Stuart Hall has said, which might be a good starting point. And he talks about the what the nation means and as that it is an ongoing project that is under constant reconstruction and that we come to know its meaning partly through the objects and artifacts which have been made to stand for and symbolize its essential values. Caribbean museums from their inception receive some form of validation as parts of nationally constructed identities, um, some of which include a kind of succinct distilla distillation of collectively authorized memory. And I want to suggest that embracing the importance and value of the notion of nation is really a key component of what we need to understand here as something which individuals and communities bear within them, um, both consciously and subconsciously, correlates with Hall's thesis that the heritage is this kind of discursive practice, uh, one of the ways in which the nation slowly constructs for itself a kind of collective social memory. Um, so I start here with this notion of how what nations go about collectively discussing and creating uh, a narrative. And I must say, I think it's multi multiple narratives into something that they identify as their identity and that the museum is a significant um, vehicle for that. Well, I'm going to touch on uh, in terms of understanding this role in history of a museum in Barbados under um, four key areas, um, and these are outlined here. And then I'm going to touch very briefly at the end of some future directions that we are planning to go in. One of the key things that um, need to be recognized is that the, the model of uh, an institution like the Barbados Museum was developed out of this uh, 18th century enlightenment concern with scientific observation, documentation, and presentation of the accumulated knowledge emanating later on from 19th century tropical environments um, was designed and the museums were designed largely to help improve 
the empire's economy and to encourage emigration to those regions. And the Barbados Museum was a part of this model being transported and applied across the, across the world, not just in the West Indies, but to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Islands, to Asia and African territories. Um, in other words, throughout the British Empire. It was a, a project of a particular nature. It was a, a project of imperial control, and it was infused with the established canon um, for Western approaches to museum creation, collection, and display in order to rationalize the emerging natural diversity of the new world and to prescribe a more scientific way of seeing or observing artifacts or specimens from foreign territories. So this 18th century European enlightenment had created a society that was curious about the world, while at the same time preoccupied with the concept of nation. And the need was advanced from uh, Britain to the rest of its empire to develop what might be called a single public culture and the creation of an authentic identity to which all of these different parts of the empire were to subscribe. Benedict Anderson has, for example, identified the museum as one of three institutions of power that profoundly shaped the way in which um, colonial state, the colonial state imagined its dominion. Uh, museums therefore were part and parcel of this extension of um, cultural as well as colonial power and and but at the same time increasingly as part of the enlightenment they were seen as instruments of education um, and of social salvation and they took their place alongside libraries churches and schools as a means of providing sound intellectual and moral culture uh, to the to the working classes at the same time. These museums were seen as a vital part of this colonial culture as they could order and make comprehensible the newness of the natural world. When we look at the origins of the Barbados Museum, as I've already explained, a lot of it is a it covers scientific considerations where government is looking to control and exploit the new natural resources um, that have emerged um, during the uh, voyages of discovery and their processes of settlement. But a really important factor is to understand that while this seems quite extreme and very far in the distant past, there's a very long memory of these scientific considerations. And this has influenced the collecting, exhibiting, and the interpretation of new knowledge until well past the mid 20th century, when newly independent nations began to assemble and present their own authoritative uh, narratives in modern museum institutions as part of a process of identity construction. Um, and this took place largely for us. It was extremely important to recognize that this first emergence of this idea of a museum occurs um, just at the end of emancipation and the beginning of uh, uh, apprenticeship. And then is clearly considered to be part of this mechanism to accommodate different working and social conditions, requirements and status in order to transform the lives of colonial citizens and inhabitants from then on. And the movement particularly achieved success in with the abolition of slavery in British colonies. So while we don't normally think of the of Caribbean museums as related to slavery, they certainly should be recognized as part of the machinery of emancipation and the change of uh, the, the, the working environment, at least, if not the social one, of from moving from slavery to freedom. <laughs> 
So where do we see the notion of the museum first being articulated? Um, and I want to say that the first time we see this word museum applied to Barbados, at least publicly, is in the Barbadian newspaper of April 9th, 1842, where it elaborates the uh, idea of uh, the fact that Barbados is falling behind because of its apathy and inertia and its backwardness and its tardiness in maturing institutions calculated to bring forward native talent and to enlighten the public mind and to encourage observation and research and to excite laudable curiosity with which to explore the wonders and secrets of nature and to encourage the promotion of all those objects which are connected with the arts and sciences. sciences. And it speaks very much about the need for um, popular communication on the subject and, and that they clearly had been efforts of similar projects before, but had not these had not been taken up. Now this group of 20 gentlemen were putting forward a prospectus for the creation or the establishment of a Barbados Institute and Colonial Museum which shall remedy this present deficiency in our said system and afford a highly interesting exhibition. Its ultimate success though, they say, however, mainly depends on the zeal with which the object is pursued. So already in 1842, which is just 10 years shy of a, of a, a century ahead of the 1933 actual opening date, you're seeing the idea of a museum being put forward by a group of citizens. Now, what was happening at this time was um, the recognition that there was a need for means to make enslaved labor, make it intelligent and orderly and, and to create new activities and then encourage a love of employment and an increased alacrity both of the body and the mind, imparting it speedily and effectually um, and may be rendered the most certain of all methods for equalizing the supply of labor with demand. So already the notion of education but for the purposes of promoting scientific and mechanical improvements was being raised within the Barbados Council and Assembly Minutes by Earl Grey and um, while we don't see that Earl Grey proceeded with the idea of the Barbados Institute which would have been put forward to him by the 20 gentlemen um, nevertheless within um, Within a few years of his statement around the need for education of the formerly enslaved, you're seeing the emergence of his replacement as governor, William Reed, who, who was lieutenant governor. Um, he, he arrives in Barbados in December 1846. But when he arrives, William Reed has already had the experience of, um, of governing Bermuda and introduced there um, in 1839, the notion of a public library and museum. When he arrives in Barbados, clearly there has been discussion and it's in the atmosphere that there's a need for a museum, but that the, his, um, his, um, predecessor uh, has not taken up that notion as an institution. So William Reed by 1846 has, um, sorry, by 1847 has moved on with the notion that he's going to put in place legislation and, and is spelling out what that, um, need, what that institution needs to be. And it's definitely a shift from what had been proposed by the gentleman as, the, as a subscription model 
to something which embeds in law the idea that this establishment should be accessible to all, regardless of race, class, or occupation. So he had been, as I said, colonial governor. Um, where he established a wider program of general education, where he was looking at the insistence on improvements in agriculture, as well as religious education, and all of these things that related to the improvement of um, the formerly enslaved, William Reed took up these notions of joining the museum with the library in helping to achieve those goals. So what he was looking at was definitely um, a, a sort of predecessor to something which occurred a hundred years later with, an, um, with uh, the 1935 report on the advisory committee on education in the colonies. Um, so that notion of education supporting the deliberate development of libraries and museums, and including the Barbados Museum, was meant to help improve the lives of um, the enslaved population, and therefore was seen largely as an educational um, institution. Reed was also particularly um, engrossed in the development of what were called the Mechanical Institute, um, which were seen as another means of uh, ensuring practical uh, education for the working classes. And it's a process which began as early as the 1820s in Scotland, um, particularly in Edinburgh and Glasgow, and as a Scot. Um, Reed, who was also an engineer, um, was particularly interested in putting forward a kind of a, of these kinds of mechanical institutes to help with um, what we would call today technical and vocational training. His um, act for establishing the public library in, uh, in the island was passed on the 21st of October of 1847. And it sought to establish in the, officer of the office of the colonial secretary, a clerk who would act as both librarian and curator, would, uh, would build from existing collections of the literary societies, would expect that it would contain books, prints, maps, and philosophical and other instruments and apparatus, and such natural and scientific subjects and productions of art as were deemed um, advisable. And it would be, as I said, open and free to all persons residing in Barbados, whether or not they were involved in military occupations or civilian. Now, this um, notion of a museum for Barbados despite having its origins in a public statement, a prospectus, even legislation um, in the 1840s, of course does not come about, even though we know that collections were probably made and were probably displayed. It was very much part of the mechanism of the library rather than a museum in and of itself. What we see, though is the convergence of these ideas of uh, a Barbados Museum with the growth and development of the, um, the international exhibition movement, which included displays from all over uh, the British Empire, not East Barbados, and the need for uh, the development of these um, processes of collecting and exhibiting started and gained traction in 1851 with the Great Exhibition, but continued down through the decades, through the series of colonial and Indian exhibitions, um, illustrating the wealth and products of the empire. Now, 
so what grew out of the international exhibitions was the the notion of creating the imperial institute of which then the colonies would be part and parcel of that um, governing body and were meant to share um, the process of collecting and disseminating knowledge primarily through this permanent institute but the way in which it was going about collecting um, specimens meant that it could ensure permanent uh, presence in London, um, encouraging attention of others to be persuaded to come out to the colonies and settle and to participate in that whole notion. Um, at the same time, it encouraged the growth of commerce manufacturing, even agriculture, were all part and parcel of the process of sharing of knowledge and communication to, if not museums per se, through collections that would eventually find their way into a museum. Um, and there were a special, a special formulation for the in Imperial Institute, including the formation and exhibition um, of important raw materials and manufactured products, the establishment and promotion of commercial museums and sample rooms, both in London and in other parts of the empire, the collection and dissemination of information relating to trades, industries, and to emigration and to the other purposes of the charter as may be of use to the subjects of empire. But note the importance of the need for the preparation and encouragement of trades and handicrafts um, by exhibitions of special uh, objects of industry and commerce and of the work of artisans and apprentices the desire to ensure there was promotion of technical and commercial education as well as industrial arts and scientists. And all of this to, to be geared towards the furtherance of systematic colonization. Well, while one stream of activity was happening um, through the advancement of agricultural societies, conservation societies, commercial societies, all of them related, or at least in conversation with the Imperial Institute in London. Others were obviously involved in this game of collecting. And um, two critical uh, uh, areas where we can see this happen is in terms of private, and personal collections such as one described by um, Anthony Frood uh, visiting Sir Graham Briggs at his Folly Hill estate in Barbados. And the other is in terms of institutions or a cabinet of curiosities as was recorded at Codrington College um, in 1914. In both instances, the, the key components of these collections were the prehistoric objects of um, of the uh, Amerindians living on the island. Now, Frood makes a point that in entering um, um, Graham Briggs' uh, hallway, he encounters this assemblage of a litter of carved curiosities, where he talks about juxtaposing of, or juxtaposition of antiquarian relics, pictures, engravings, books, maps, and manuscripts, which at the other end demonstrated the fine culture of civilized citizens. Um, and that left little room for the majority of the population whom he otherwise effectively dismissed in his discussion saying that there are no people here in the West Indies in any true sense of the word. So, while he was looking at this and admiring this Aladdin's cave of um, prehistoric material um, as juxtaposed with the all the fine um, engravings and books and prints and images that could be accumulated by a knowledgeable antiquarian such as Sir Graham Briggs, um, nevertheless, 
he left little room for doubt that there would be an any anything anything mm, that might be regarded as a nation. But I will come back to fruit in a different way when I'm discussing what Barrow talks about a hundred years after fruit description. So um, we need to understand this uh, context in which museum development then continues largely in the hands of private individuals or in terms of in educational institutions like Coddington College. Um, but public museums don't really make an appearance until much later on. Um, and here we begin to see the emergence of um, uh, descriptions. Let me see, I go back here of um, the need for a museum uh, in the island as late as 1903 um, in various of the traveler uh, traveler guides to the Caribbean. Um, and noting that the, the that the if you like the colony was deficient by not having a museum and urging urging the settlers to make every effort to produce one. Um, this really didn't receive uh, a sort of any great impetus until it became clear in the 1920s that Reverend Watson, Reverend Griffith Watson, uh, really who had been uh, a sort of a key uh, collector and researcher on the island's um, uh, prehistoric heritage, had decided that he needed to make it accessible to the public and he offered it around to various institutions, organizations, on um, finally um, coming up with an approach to uh, the, um, the civic society. And um, nothing happens really because although the civic society agreed to take on this role of caring for uh, Reverend Watson's collections. And nothing much happens in terms of displaying it until um, Reverend Watson has to inform them in 1929 that he has been offered uh, significant funds if he will sell his collection to uh, a collector in the United States. And 1929 is then uh, a sort of trigger to the the need to acquire this collection, um, and primarily they make a case for public funds to be um, used through the House of Assembly. Um, there was a somewhat grudging response to this desire, and funds were eventually produced to acquire the collection. But 1929 was also the year in which the Museums Association. Um, in the UK developed a proposal for the Carnegie Corporation to fund where, the, where they looked at developing a survey of museums in around the British Empire, including the development of museums where, they, where these didn't exist and the formation of an annual training school. And um, all of this to gear towards the need for greater accessibility, promotion, and control to these uh, natural resources and to these antiquities. What we find though is from, uh, from May 1933, with the establishment of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, we begin to see these ideas of museum being discussed within the pages of the journal. Um, and one of the first reports that they publish is the report of the Carnegie commissioners about the status of museums in the British West Indies, which noted that they were without exception, and that included obviously the very newly formed Marvelous Museum, 
on historical society that they were lacking in financial support from government. They were almost totally managed and supported by volunteers. They lacked proper facilities and professional staff and were treated as the annex to public libraries and were allowed to become Cinderella's, as he called them. The Bather and Shepherd report continued on with the notion of a need to create a federation of mu museums of the smaller colonies in the West Indies to form and pool resources and to hire a trained traveling curator. Um, and noted that while educational exhibits were important, it must always be remembered that teaching is based on knowledge, that knowledge springs from research and that research must be, be um, based on abundant material and that if a museum is to be used for serious study, even elementary, it must have room in which students can handle and examine the specimens. So this trend of regard for the museum as an educational institution continued almost unbroken for almost a hundred years before the establishment of Bobby's Museum. And it continued in the pages of the journal and in the public programming of the museum from the 1930s onwards. The Carnegie Corporation spoke about the need for museums to present a definite history of its colony in each of these so that it would supplement the uh, curriculum of the secondary schools and higher grade establishments. Um, the Carnegie Corporation also proposed um, a formal structure to the exhibits and not surprisingly, and Lennox, I think you'll recognize this, they started with the geological structure, uh, the rocks, fossils, and geological maps. They talked about soils and physical ge geography, meteorolo meteorology, flora and fauna, natural history formed, therefore, the foundation of what could be regarded as human history. First, they said, come the Aboriginal tribes and their remains because it was very much understood that the Amerindians as such did not exist any longer in Barbados, but also in much of the Caribbean, which of course was not the case. But then you followed that with the succession of dominant European races ending in British occupation. Then you might include the relics of slavery and domestic bygones, to bring the collections down to the present. And for the later periods, you might include portraits and prints, photographs and plans, which will be acquired and stored. And lastly, the present activities of the colony should be illustrated by its economic products, models of steamers with fruit storage apparatus, charts of trade route. So it's def definitive in terms of trade, commerce, communication and recognizing the importance of natural resources. And by the way, humans um, did inhabit Barbados as well. I want to continue because that process of teasing out the, important, the importance of these relics of history and natural history does take um, shape in the post Second World War period, and particularly with the emergence of the Moyne Report, where it talks about the critical problems um, being the issue of education and explicitly curricular reform, where in their view, um, most of the schools were still out of touch with the needs and interests of the vast bulk of the population. Um, I think that the what their resulting position was though um was the need for a revision and simplification of the cultural curriculum concentrating on clear and connected speech and thought and giving subjects where possible a west indian background rather than an english one was critically important to the the development of these museums and particularly the need for teaching of history and geography with special reference to the west indies and radiating from there and using lo local topography and historical monuments. Um, 
so they ended by concluding that we hope to see education become the special care of the controller of the West India Welfare Fund. And um, all of this tied back then to the emergence, again, in the Barbados Museum, but elsewhere in the region, the Institute of Jamaica, the Victoria Institute in Trinidad and elsewhere, all were understanding that they could um, gain access to some significant public funding through the West Indian Welfare Fund, providing that they were able to support the kind of vision for um, teaching um, and education in history um, and geography. Well, within, uh, uh, within two years of that, we then see in the museum journal, uh, extracts from a plan of regional museum development. And in this instance, the museum has engaged with uh, a Canadian um, museum educator who then proceeds to lay out what he considers to be the most uh, reasonable plan for museum education. So the idea of the museum, while it has, while the museum has become uh, an entity is still evolving largely amongst the, the members of the museum, but also within the pages of the journal and um, in terms of certain of its programs and exhibits. But in this, um, in this particular article, Tordoff speaks about the museum as being important because it helps the individual himself to discover new interests, to develop his potentialities through increasing efficiency and, uh, at and diversity in his occupation. And therefore he stresses that a museum like the Bogus Museum is an organization for education, not competitive with the school, primary, secondary and technical or with the library, rather it is complementary to all of these. Um, and then he speaks increasingly about the role of the museum as part of its community. If it is to continue to function effectively, it must necessarily keep pace with this constant evolution of um, society. He also speaks about the importance of the investment in the museum to continue to yield the most substantial return then it must be planned on a long-term basis in relation to the future need and development of the community it is to serve. And the fact remains that the public is increasingly and actively interested in what is the museum's province, whether it be art, industrial design, applications of arts and science and natural sciences. He goes on to quote, and I think it's quite interesting though, because um, in the pages of the museum, Tordoff, is already effectively seeing a connection between the Barbados Museum and other museums in the region um, and elsewhere. He sees this connection to the international heritage and museum sector, whereby he's talking about the, um, uh, he, he's already tuned in to the second, uh, General Assembly of UNESCO and its Director General, um, Julius Huxley. And Julius Huxley notes that um, UNESCO is, is obliged, it's obliged, so this is 1947, so it's less than two years after the formation of UNESCO, UNESCO is obliged to take account not only of all aspects of science and all aspects of culture, and also of all means of preserving and transmitting these, whether through education, through the apparatus of books and libraries, museums and the art galleries, or through the modern techniques of mass communications, but also of their interrelations. So the cultural diversity on um, the need for interrelations between the sciences and the arts, between the libraries and the museums and art galleries, and the notion of use of 
modern techniques of mass communication are already being presented as a means for the development of the museum as part of this vision for modernizing um, the continued evolution of modern culture in Barbados. Oh, why is it not moving on? Um, come on. Now, this um, development in terms of the need for planning um, of museums and the need for acknowledging the educational components of museums continues at least until, um, it continues to be a major part of, of what the Barbados Museum absorbs as part of its mandate, as part of its role. And um, the appointment of Neville Connell um, makes a major contribution in this field because he comes with the notion of the need for expanded communications and connections and exchanges with other institutions, both within the region and beyond. And he puts his focus, he makes history, but more than history, art and more than art, contemporary, modern contemporary art, his focal point in achieving those goals. Now he's part uh, of the planning then that occurs with the creation of the Federation of the West Indian Nations, le um, which led the British Council to call in 1956 for the establishment of a federal museum to be included in the planning for the federal buildings to be erected. So Connell is already engaged with this um, process of connection um, with his colleagues throughout the region, but he's given further impetus by the idea of developing a federal museum and the need to subscribe and to share collections with that entity. Never mind that the Federation didn't last longer than four years, it nevertheless already generated a, a type of activity which was increasingly important in comprehending um, Barbadian history as part of regional history. The Federal Museum was meant to be part of, uh, part of the, what would you say, the allotment of federal buildings uh, being planned and designed in the federal headquarters, which was in Trinidad. Um, but it was desirous of ensuring that a process whereby Britain maintained a certain level of control, but it was lessening the dependence of their colonies on the privy purse in England through what they proposed to be this federation. As I said, it didn't last, but the, the move away from colonial status um, also found itself uh, as mentioned or as part of the uh, guidance being offered within the museum. So if you look at that framework, then you can see how um, the museum began to recognize that it needed to look on the uh, the evolution of an independence movement as part and parcel of its exhibits. It had been assessed um, and found lacking in, in 30s. It hadn't had, however, been making attempts through the hiring of various um, uh, professional uh, curators or collectors primarily though in geology and natural sciences. But now the director curator Neville Connell comes and he is recognizing that there are other deficiencies, particularly in acknowledging the historic origins of the people of the island. And in, in that sense, we see that he recognizes the deficiencies when he's um, included in uh, communication that um, Lady Gilbert Carter writes in January of 1953 
to indicate that she had originally intended to leave Sir Gilbert's African collection, which had been in the front hall of Ilaro Court, to the nation, to the Barbados Museum. Now, in, his, in her will, she had left it in the Barbados Museum. But she says, I feel sure that the historical society will waive this and let it go to Nigeria as it came from there. I sort of thought that Mr. Shilston, the president of the society, was not anxious to have it. He rightly stressed the idea that the Arawaks were the only heathens which should interest the covered people in Barbados and that they should be encouraged to forget that they were brought over from there against their will. So direct identification of what had been obfuscating on um, part of the historical retelling of the Bollywood Museum. Um, I reference now the guides to the Bollywood Museum because in this context, we know that this transition also occurs in terms of the ways in which uh, the museum exhibits were interpreted to the public. In the first uh, edition of What to See at the Barbados Museum, compiled by Thomas Shepard, one of the two Carnegie commissioners, by the way, in 1937. In the 37 guide, there's one reference to African heritage on the island, and that was in respect to the pineapple pennies issued in the island. Um, and these pine pennies were presented. Um, to show what the monetary uh, arrangements in Barbados were in the, um, in the 18th century. That was the one reference in the guidebook in any way, shape, or form. So um, Connell is already beginning to make contact with his colleagues with whom he had trained, Hull and Bristol and elsewhere, and is seeking help to assemble relics of slavery in the form of slave trains, yokes, et cetera, for the museum, which in which it was presently sadly lacking um, and that he had not found relics to be obtainable locally, except for a few documents relating to the sale and transfer of slaves. There was nothing to remind visitors of this period in the island's history. So, if you look almost 10 years forward from the first guidebook, you're then looking at the second edition of the guidebook in 1956. Um, and that was now being prepared by Connell. And Connell reflects the significant progression in terms of the development of historical interpretation, the development of collections and policies, and indicates that the whole gallery has been developed specifically to expose the history of slavery and sugar on the island. Uh, he details the importation of, of uh, enslaved Negroes from Africa uh, to work on the sugar plantations. Uh, he details the, the sheer size of the population rising from 50 in 1629, uh, I mean, en enslaved Africans to 6,000 by 1643. So, and then in 1838, the year when slavery was finally abolished, that number exceeded 82,000. So there was a conscious decision um, by 56 to make sure that this other aspect of um, Barbadian heritage was told within the walls of the museum. Um, and that was largely through the work of Mel O'Connell. Now, I, I wanted to mention a couple more things that occurred sort of like, uh, as I said, not quite a chronology, but I thought it was interesting because again, due to the work of Neville O'Connell, you've reached the development, not just of the collections, um, where he has been encouraging generous donations of collections, but also generous donations of funding to support the opening of new galleries at the museum. So the, the museum itself advances these ideas. And in November 1965, it invites the premier, 
the Honorable Errol Wharton Barrow. Um, and remember that Barrow is on the eve of independence. So he says rather jokingly, but not quite so jokingly, that he had wondered why he'd been asked to open the Cunard Gallery. And now he knew the reason was that government had given a large sum of money towards the gallery. And if government could afford to give so much money to this gallery, we could surely afford independence. And he did not know what persuasive power Sir John Chandler exercised, but he was unable to get certain repairs carried out at his office. At the end of his speech, though, the, Kuna, uh, the premier said that the Kuna Gallery would help Barbadians to look backwards and forwards at the same time. So Winston Churchill had said that if you wanted people to go forward anyway, they had to be able to look back. And if you wanted people to look back, they had to have something to look forward to. He had much pleasure in opening the Kuna Gallery. So he's already seeing the role of the museum as part of the framework for the development of an independent nation. Not to say that there were not criticisms because the criticisms continued, um, but that there was an awareness that the Barbados Museum could help to serve this notion of self-awareness and growth of identity amongst the Barbadian population. And uh, you all will know the speech that he, he made about what kind of mirror image do you have of yourself? So, Literally 20 years after that statement, he is also speaking here, similarly um, during the population. But I also wanted to note that uh, his statement was followed in 73 by um, the Minister of Education, and later Prime Minister of Barbados, the Honorable Erskine Sandiford, who stated that the attainment of independence in this country in 1966 constitutes an important watershed in the historical development in the country. And therefore it was even more necessary now that a new consciousness, a more intense search for identity and for the roots of our being and belonging must be experienced. The way forward depends upon our knowledge of who we are now and whence we came. And it depends on our conception of the past, a prescription for change, and change we must, depends upon a true and deep understanding of the present and the past. Each generation faces the task of interpreting and reinterpreting the past. So again, in the setting of the Shilston Library at the museum, in 73, uh, the Minister of Education is insistent on the the fact that the Barbados Museum and its library had an important role to play and had so far been found critically short of that advantage, but was looking forward to seeing how this could work. Now, um, at the first session of, um, of this, um, this presentation, um, you would have heard uh, so Woodville Marshall speak about the development of the first development plans and the rationale and the, if you like, the context in which that happened. And so my statement uh, bringing you up to 73 was meant to ensure that you could then connect directly through this prehistory of the Barbados Museum to where the museum then went in the 20th and 21st century based on this need to desire, this desire to meet these goals and to ensure that they had a relevant and practical objective um, in helping Barbadians to achieve independence of identity. I want to speak just very briefly now about where we will be going in the future because we perceive the importance of um, the continued development and orchestration, not just of our own exhibits, but uh, the interpretation of sites elsewhere as being critical to our um, helping Barbadians to comprehend 
appreciate and interrogate their history and heritage even today. Newton and Slade Bioground, which was gifted to the Barbados Museum in the mid to late 70s, was part of that process, a process which it took about another three decades to evolve. One of the ways in which we are growing in that um, process is our interaction with different groups. Um, the museum has finally formulated um, a development committee for Newton and Slade Bioground, which is looking critically at the kinds of interpretation of site. Um, uh, my colleague, Kevin Farmer, has already spoken about the archeological importance of the site and the intentions that we want to undertake in that space um, as a means for connecting many more Barbadians with that historical past in a meaningful fashion. But one of the ways in which we can do this is also through the kind of performances that we have been encouraging um, primarily through, uh, through students at um, Barbados Community College, uh, University of the West Indies, and artists uh, who also use that space as both impetus and inspiration uh, for their productions. Here is one that was um, developed and performed by the UWI Performing Arts Group called Newton and Silence. <laughs> film production by these two. I want to congratulate Yvonne Weeks and her team, her students and her, um, and her institution, obviously UWI, for recognizing the potential of not just using the space, but using the historical information provided to develop exciting productions. And we're looking forward to seeing the full length Newton and Silence as it emerges as part of the season of emancipation later this year. But moving on, we also wanted to, to recognize the considerable efforts being made by the government of Barbados, primarily through the um, important efforts of the prime minister, who has recognized that Newton also plays a role as um, can play a key role in helping Barbadians to connect with the past and, and to recognize that Newton's role is not simply at the national level or even the regional, but it has international significance, given the role that Barbados has to play in the development of plantation slavery. And as we have learned uh, with recent um, research in the development of the slave trade itself, because the sheer size of the um, number of vessels traversing the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean from the west coast of Africa to Barbados is just astounding. Here is um, a presentation which a number of Barbadians will have seen uh, looking at the role of uh, Newton Barrel Ground as the impetus for developing a monument to the enslaved and space for reflection and introspection as well as healing. Um, this initiative has taken on board um, the, uh, the growth and development both of a major collection on the digitization of the archival record which speaks to that experience, but they also saw the need to tie together with the, the relevant, relevant space and bring these together in, in, a, in a very real way through the development um, of an associated 
Museum of the Enslaved and um, Center for Family Research. So I'll play this short video now, um, uh, produced by Ajay Associates for the proposed Newton Enslaved Biogram Monument. Masa baby wo gala bi o Masa baby wo gala bi o Masa baby wo gala bi o For he kill me he ship be regular Um, the wonderful work that uh, uh, Maestro Roger Gibbs did in first of all uncovering and documenting as part of the Memory of the World, UNESCO's Memory of the World International Register, that slave chant, which was found in the archives of Gloucester, um, Gloucester Records Office. Um, I think there are all kinds of ways in which we are unlocking the heritage of Barbados, that the museum continues to play that role. And we look forward to, and um, one last point that I'm going to, to make, we look forward to uncovering more about our stories in our museum, um, looking at the process of transitioning um, the curatorial control from the hands of the, the staff of the museum and into developing a much more co-creative and co-curation model with our community. Um, and part of that is opening up and identifying new stories, uh, a new, uh, new storylines to be able to be um, uh, transforming our main exhibits, our core exhibits. And in fact, we are very pleased to have um, received uh, the support of our Ministry of Tourism in the advancement of the development of the core exhibits of the museum um, which transformation will take place over the next uh, two to three years, I believe. So we are looking forward to putting into action 
the kinds of modeling, the kinds of um, research, the kinds of partnerships with the population that we feel will be the best way forward in developing, um, exploring and identifying new means of community activism and new methodologies um, which we consider to be important for a socially responsible and responsive museum. Thank you. We can't hear you, Chair. No. Yes, thank you very much, Alessandra. Sorry about that. Um, it was muted uh, for for that great overview. And as you mentioned at the beginning, it's the idea. It's before the actual establishment and the ideas that came together very close to the period of emancipation, beginning this new idea about uh, museums and what you put in them and how they are represented the islands. And then of course, what we maybe had forgotten was that concurrently with this, and you made mention of that as well, that there were these international or empire-wide ex um, ex exhibitions that taking place, particularly the great exhibition of 1851 in London, where all of the colonies, including Barbados, contributed uh, artifacts, mainly product products, to be uh, displayed there, so that there was this awareness that it was a vehicle to, to publicize and to promote um, uh, the island. And then right up to the uh, independence era and post-independence era and the comments, for instance, of the premier of the time, uh, the Honorable Errol Barrow in 1965, um, and the Minister of Education in 1973, the fact that, um, they were, were recognizing the, the museum and its work. And, and one almost gets the impression that in their visits, they hadn't fully realized uh, how effective the museum was and how important it was and what it was doing. And the realization that it had to be included very much so in both education and of course, later on with the shift to tourism, um, a means of uh, promoting and explaining the island uh, to the visitor and providing an extra tourism product. So this has become another phase of, of that uh, development. So, so thank you very much indeed. And then of course, leading on to those last uh, video clips uh, of that big expansive um, program uh, project for the future, the uh, Newton uh, Slave Cemetery site. Thanks again, Alessandra. And I'm going to try to work out if people did while the uh, presentation was going on, ask questions. Perhaps I'll need uh, the assistance of the technical staff. But um, Kevin Farmer, uh, host and panelist, excellent presentation. Thank you, Alessandra. That's just come up quickly. Um, and uh, I hope that we had some persons involved in museum activities elsewhere in the region, and certainly your colleagues uh, further on, beyond, uh, because you, you, you have established yourself as quite an internationalist in, in museum um, administration. Uh, um, if I could have a little assistance in uh, feeding back in the chat, uh, I see here that, um, well, there was this one which says, um, excellent presentation. Can't, thank you, Alessandra. What if anything is left from the Federation, the Federal Museum? That's a question there. Oh, it's a good question, um, but a terrible one at the same time, um, because it, it demonstrates what happens when, um, when a project comes to an abrupt end, and there have been no um, no efforts uh, to put in place plans for a, an orderly return uh, 
of the artifacts. What I understand to have happened from what I was able to see was that um, in terms of some of the pieces that went into the collections, they seem to have focused primarily on, um, on modern and contemporary art first. So those collections, some of them by, let's say almost osmosis, they, they never returned them to the island of origins, but at the same time, there was no formal uh, documentation as to exactly what went. So nobody could make real claims on these things. And we believe that those collections remain with the, um, what was then the uh, Victoria Institute, um, later on the National Museum of Trinidad and Tobago. So there, that was where it was. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, one of the key things that we've learned um, with these projects is that when we talk about our, um, our cultural heritage and our identity, we seem to think that um, because a museum has four walls, that these notions should be confined within it. When in fact, what we are finding, and increasingly so in the last decade or more, is the need to expand and to share that knowledge well beyond um, the boundaries of our small countries and the boundaries of our small museums. And there's a greater appreciation that um, it's no longer acceptable for, uh, if you like, major museums to take on the role of simply deciding that they're going to tell the definitive stories of Caribbean histories or Caribbean arts or Caribbean science, and that they need to engage with um, museums in those parts of the world in order to have a much more equitable um, space in telling those stories. So I think there's no reason why those pieces should not stay in Trinidad and Tobago because it provides us with an opportunity to connect with them in the future. Hello. Yes. Dr. Honeychurch may be frozen, but in the meantime, uh, there's a question from Mary Hill Harris. She is asking if there is a place where she can see the text of the saved chat that she just heard as she could not understand all of the words. Yes, indeed. Um... Okay, I don't know if you have an opportunity, but um, Mary Hill, good to hear you uh, and to, to know that you're with us. Um, just to say that the slave chant is uh, accessible on the International Memory of the World Register. So the, the, the words are there um, and the words have been publicized in various locations online um, and in exhibits. But what we can do is to circulate a link to the um, to the the words so that you're able to see them. Um, they were transcribed by a visitor to the island who heard uh, the enslaved chanting these words as they were working in the field. Uh, we have another question uh, from Miguel Pena. He says, in light of the planned restructuring of the educational system in Barbados, has government included the Barbados Museum and other museums and heritage sites in Barbados within its new educational plan? I think you know that you could speak on that matter better than I can, Kay. <laughs> so could you speak I, on I, that matter? <laughs> I, I could. Uh, it was not my presentation, so I did not want to overreach. Um, for sure, um, I personally have been invited to sit on both the history and the geography syllabus development committees um, for the current Ministry of Education. Uh, we also have linkages, working linkages with some other government departments, the Learning Resource Department and so on with regard 
um, to influencing what is being taught in schools with regard to education. And we will, of course, continue to work for them. And of course, a number of our staff are resource persons, examiners, markers, et cetera, for CXC as well. So it is not just in Barbados, but it is Caribbean wide as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your question, Miguel. I have some there's, answers for you too. <laughs> right, there's another question from uh, oh, is M. Mukwat. Thank you, Alessandra, for your presentation. In British Guyana in the mid 19th century, the Royal Agricultural and Commercial Society, founded in 1844, established the British Guyana Museum in 1868 as a cultural and commercial society. They played a role in the cultural development and the publication of the journal Time Re. Did the RA and CS output have any influence on the museum development in Barbados? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Tamari um, and the Guyana Museum, yes, I would say there probably was some influence. What, what we find is that um, certainly with the provisions of the um, of the Carnegie Corporation and their deliberations. They, they did this overall survey report um, on the status of all the museums. And that report was circulated to all the museums and libraries in the, in the region. What we do find is that there is some communication between um, the, the museums for different things. So for example, um, there were sample exhibits of wood, um, uh, which have been included in our museum's collection for a long time, but which included specimens from Guyana and most probably were made, were facilitated by uh, the British Guyana Museum, then the National Museum of Guyana. Um, and then there was sharing of information. There were geological and other surveys where information was shared. Um, scientific reports were shared. Um, and then um, I will say that uh, Dr. Dennis Williams in his capacity and later on did make efforts to ensure that um, information about the uh, Aboriginal cultures and people of Ghana was shared with um with others in the region what what we do see is that uh Neville Connell for example and others who followed him participated for example in the first development of the the development of the first and second and others of the um uh, the the Association for Caribbean Archaeology, which eventually became the International Association for Caribbean Archaeology, and they were present from the from the inception. So from from the sixties, people from from all over the region were participating in that process and were sharing information via that mechanism. So I do see sharing of reports, sharing of information, um, even sometimes sharing of specialized people, although I couldn't swear that for British Guyana, um, and even specimens were shared um, amongst the institutions. Thanks for that question, though. Lennox, are you vocal yet, or? If not, are there any other questions? We don't currently have any more questions in either the chat or the q and A. I don't think at the moment. Okay. Um, we appear to have lost Dr. Honey Search. So <laughs> I guess I will do a little substituting for him. And thank you very much for your time and your expertise this oh. afternoon. Uh, Ms. Cummins, it was as always an informative and interesting conversation with you about the history of the museum in Barbados and of histories in the region on the whole.
Um, always a fascinating topic. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. And thank you so much for joining us this year um, on our 90th anniversary year, on our 90th anniversary day uh, for the UWI Barbados Museum and Historical Society uh, annual lecture series. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And thank you, Lennox, for being here and sharing. Who is this?